So welcome all at Molly. My name is Matthijs Dabok. I'm talking tonight about deploying microservices done right. Um, I gave this uh, title a while ago and um, now I I've been investigating microservices the last couple of months and it's been sort of a journey for me. Um, maybe this title is a bit pretentious, but it was merely to trigger you to come here because maybe I'm not that big of an expert as I claim uh, I am. But I would like to take you on this journey that I, uh, that I have went on the last couple of months to, um, to investigate microservices and all the things I, I covered. And I hope that there's something in my presentation for every one of you. How many of you have an application you consider to be monolithic? <laughs> Show of hands. That's uh, that's interesting. So to the same people, uh, how many of you want to cut it down a bit? I think that's sort of the same amount of people there. Is there anyone that said no? Oh, yes, yes to the first question and no to the second question. Ah, do you do you want to comment on why? Well, sometimes things get cut up wrong. Sometimes they get cut up too small. Right. Sometimes even rather small things can be monolithic. Okay. Oh. But but cutting down a large application doesn't always mean that it becomes more simple. True. I'll, I'll cover that later. Okay. So of the same people that just raised their hands, how many of you already started to cut down on the... Well, often the, the problem is that the <coughs> architecture of the application doesn't make them easy to deploy. And the thing I want to talk about uh, partially today as well is how to deploy these microservices. Um, and um, so be before I continue to talk about it, there might be some people that don't know what it is. And I, I use uh, um, the words of Sam Newman, a small autonomous services that work together modeled around a business domain. Uh, and um, I one of the things I did in my journey was to, to read this book and, and kind of uh, watch a lot of his slides. Um, because uh, he had a lot of inter interesting things to say. And actually I want to touch upon today a couple of the, um, a couple of the main principles, but I want to focus basically on uh, these four. <coughs> and um, these two are uh, the hide implementation details and deploy independently kind of merge together in my talk, so you, you'll see. Um, who knows who this guy is? Last question. Is it no? Sam? No, it's not Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas McElroy. Does, does that name ring a bell to anyone? No? Okay. It was actually an early Unix pioneer. I would say something in the 50s. <laughs> it was actually more in it the 70s. Like. It is actually 70s, exactly. It's, it was in the 70s. And uh, he is the inventor of the pipe symbol in Unix. So um, he, made, he made it possible to build things in a component based way. And um, if you don't know what the pipe symbol is, for example, you can have one command and you can pipe the, uh, the result of that command into another command. Um, so in this case I'm listing a, a, a folder and um, I'm getting my own name out of there seeing if there's a file folder with my name in there. And um, while going through my journey I stumbled on a couple of quotes of this guy that really made me think about um, why microservices uh, are so great, and why, um, and and I asked myself why didn't someone come up with it before, and people did of course, but let me show you some of his quotes. Make each program do one thing well, to do a new job, build a fresh rather than complicate old programs by adding new features. Hey, that kind of sounds familiar, right? So. Um, Maybe some people will recognize it as like the single uh, responsibility principle. Like, hey, this, this is pretty smart. Uh, another thing he said was, expect the output of every program to become the input to another as yet unknown program. Don't clutter output with extraneous information. Avoid stringently columnar or binary input formats. Don't insist on interactive input. So it was like, okay, make it simple. Huh? 
keep it simple. Um, input can become output. Uh, 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 output can become input to another program. This is exactly what he meant with this pipe symbol. And the third one is design and build software, even operating systems, to be tried early, ideally within weeks. Don't hesitate to throw away the clumsy parts and rebuild them. This is one of the other things that is actually, I would say, vitally important to microservices, the why I will come back to later. So the first um, subject I want to talk about uh, is the model the uh, around the business domain. So um, this is actually the definition of the single responsibility principle. Gather together the things that change for the same reason and separate the things that change for different reasons. And um, a lot of you probably um, learned this type of architecture in school or at work, oh, the three-tier architecture. And lots of businesses are built upon this, uh, this architecture. You have your presentation layer, your business layer data. So we were like, okay, we're, we're pulling apart these um, responsibilities. This is like single responsibility, right? We have a presentation layer, it's a, it's a responsibility. Um, but the problem is every time um, you have to touch something or you have to add a feature to, to this kind of architecture, you have to touch the presentation layer, you need to add something to the business layer. And maybe, yeah, you need to change your database, so you have to have some data access. So you have to, if, if you split your organization in a way like this, then everyone, every time you introduce a new feature, everyone needs to be <coughs> hustled up and be ready to introduce this feature. So um, instead of slicing things horizontally, like the, the three-tier architecture, we should slice things vertically. So for example, you know, invoicing product uh, like <coughs> this. If you have your product and your teams uh, um, like this, then you can have teams that are uh, completely autonomous in their, in their uh, handling. They can uh, be, become experts on their own uh, subject. And they can be autonomous in deploying this feature because they don't need someone from the team front and someone from the team back end. No, they can just say, okay, we have a team where everyone that we need to release this thing is there and we can. Well, this, this um, idea was um, um, not per se introduced, but very well uh, explained in the book of uh, Domain Driven Design, um, where Eric Evans is explaining how you best composite your, your, your architecture. And um, he, he explains how um, these different uh, features, basically, in your company, like I just said, the, the uh, invoicing system, for example, um, how they are um, bounded in a way, and they, he calls it bounded contacts, contexts. And of course, you have, for example, a, a customer service in your system where everyone kind of needs to interact with them and everyone has a different view on this uh, on this uh, customer and um, well if you want to know more about that I would strongly <coughs> advise you to read at least an abstract or something uh, of his book it's very very valuable um, also in the book very important that he describes is that um, when a service is modeled <coughs> around a business domain uh, they are much more stable. They don't tend to change very often because your business process is, um, and certainly when your company becomes older, your business domain starts to stabilize and uh, the interactions between the services start to be more normalized. So you can uh, ease more easily um, model them this way. Second thing I want to talk about is the hide implementation details. But while I was making these uh, slides, I was um, <coughs> kind of getting the, 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 the idea that the theme should be more like how to not break other people's shit. Um, so, because the things that I learned is um, that we often see an architecture like this where you have an application that is really from a database <coughs> and then once you're uh, company grows and maybe 
when you tried out microservices because you thought, okay, this is a new trend, I need to investigate some time in this. Um, you thought, okay, let's put some microservice next to it, and well, since I have a lot of information like that is interesting for in my database, maybe the customers or something, let's let maybe this other microservice needs to read from it too, because it needs the customer object. This is a very bad idea, um, because try to try to change the schema of this database. It will be very difficult uh, to do this and not break the second service. And the more and more services you, or even in your monolithic application, the more uh, different parts of your application you let uh, into the internals of your database, the more tightly coupled system you get. This is a very bad idea. So, okay, so how should you do it? Empty slide. Ah, this is, you should hide your database. Hide your database. <laughs> so how does that work? Well, you talk basically to the other <coughs> service and you ask him to get the information for you. But you might say, okay, but this will be slow or no, I need this information. Like I want to be directly coupled to this, uh, this database or um, I don't know. But you all, then you will have the problem of the too, too, too tightly coupled stuff. Or maybe you should think that if, if it so desperately needs this database, maybe you shouldn't have split it into services after all. Maybe they should be together actually. This is how your comment arises, uh, okay, maybe you shouldn't split in two small parts because then you, you get a lot of communication between these two. That might be dangerous. Okay, maybe it actually needs his own information and it needs to have its own database and maybe you need to extract it from the other one and make sure it's in a separate database, not to clutter up um, these services. Okay, you say, well, actually the same goes for the monolith. So <coughs> these others. Oh, too bad there was a box around it. But the box around basically says, okay, it doesn't have to be services. Maybe when you are still in the, in the uh, monolith uh, area of your company, uh, these two might be in the, same, in the same application, but the same goes for that. So um, you might say, no, but I have um, one part of my application that reads from this table and the other part reads from this table. Oh yeah, are you not secretly like querying or joining them under the hood or somewhere? Um, maybe you should try to to really put them in different databases and see what happens to your application next. How do you secure the integrity of the database once you are end up with putting things on different databases? Um, like the customer here, the customer there. So I'm, I'm, uh, with the two databases, I didn't mean to replicate the information, um, but for example, um, one service might uh, want to have a part of the customer, for example, for the sales department, a customer looks very different than to the, um, uh, the shipping department of a company. Uh, so the, sh the shipping department just wants to know the customer ID and which orders they have. They don't really, or, or maybe the address, of course, they need to ship it to something. But um, the, the sales department only is really interested in how much sales this person had and, and whatever. So even the customer can be can be in a completely different service than the than the sales or the uh, shipping department as long as the the source of truth will be this customer service and the the other services have the data that they that they need in their own databases um, within those databases uh, th there might be uh, similar records like address right. and so if you change it on one side how, how do you ensure the integrity with the I think uh, you should try uh, at least to uh, keep your uh, information in one place and have it have it to be the, si the single source of truth. Uh, if you really have to replicate data to another service for uh, for fast response times, for example, uh, still keep the uh, the first database at the source of truth, but let it uh, uh, be like eventually consistent uh, in the other database. So. Uh, make them synchronize, but still keep the customer service as the single source of truth. Okay. Um, so even when you, you have a monolith, you could do the same thing. You can have multiple databases in the same monolith uh, working uh, on your application. And once you... Um, it's too bad that you can't show the see the boxes, but once you have this situation in your monolith, 
it's way easier to split off a chunk. Even Maybe you don't want it at first because these are too tightly coupled. Maybe you don't want to split them. Um, but you only find out by having this situation and seeing how much uh, communication goes between these two. And finally, if you, if you really think it adds value, you can actually make them asynchronous and really pull them apart to another system. Um, another thing I learned is uh, about the tolerant reader pattern. And the uh, tolerant reader pattern says a reader should be able to ignore changes we don't care about. And uh, f I found XPath for the people that use XML, for example, and JSONPath for people that use JSON. And basically, what it says is that, for example, you have uh, a request like this, uh, or a response like this, and you need to get out the, um, the payment method. I want to get out the payment method. Of course, you could you know, go in and say, OK, I want the payment, then method. This is using a JSON path. And then you would get a response of ideal. Uh, but this is very, um, I mean, you're really assuming the structure of your response. If you would make it a bit more flexible, you could actually say, OK, I want the method, whatever layer it is in. So for example, if I change my <coughs> response to have multiple transactions, maybe because you have a layered payment, a stack payment, um, <coughs> Because you are uh, 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 you're reading, trying to find the method this way, uh, it doesn't matter in which layer it is. It will find it anyway. In this case, it will find multiple. But because in the first place you are already assuming to to get, oops, uh, to get an array back, your application won't break. Oops, once you um, once you use this uh, JSON path uh, way. So you can basic and with XML you can do exactly the same the same thing. So don't assume anything about the, the response you're getting back and be flexible in what you can, uh, can read. So another thing to um, keep in mind is to use a technology agnostic APIs, uh, to use um, RESTful uh, or at least REST um, to hide your implementation details. I see, I've seen some uh, organization that use very tight-knit communication, like RPC calls that need to know a lot about the implementation uh, on the other services uh, side, um, which makes it very brittle, because if the other service changes the implementation, you, I mean, you don't have the response to work with. Um, and then the other thing I learned is actually that RESTful has multiple um, multiple uh, maturity levels. And um, until now, I've been using a lot of the apparently level two uh, RESTful, um, RESTful maturity level. Um, at the level one is actually is when you have resources in, in REST. Uh, level two is when you use HTTP verbs, so when you use like get and post and delete. And <laughs> level three is when you use hypermedia as the engine of application state. Well, really needed an acronym, don't you think? <laughs> kind of a mouthful. So who knows what hate OS is? Yeah, but <laughs> what what does it do? What is it? So it's links. It's links exactly. So when you have this restful resource. You can have links to other interesting related resources. So, for example, when you have a payment, you can have, um, uh, or you have an account, you have a balance, and you can link to, uh, well, itself. Okay, if you need to get the balance again, you can get it here. Uh, maybe if you want to do a deposit, you can do it there, or a withdraw, you can do it there. This is the verb you need to use. And, well, then you say, okay, but why is it, what is so special about this? And why is it called state? Well, it's stateful because when you change the balance of the account to zero, you won't get the option to withdraw, which actually makes sense. So if you have in your application, you have some buttons that say, okay, uh, withdraw or deposit, you can, by this, you can know oh, it's, it's not available. I, don't, I, I, I won't show it or I will gray it out or I will disable it. Very handy. So now... Uh, Next time you can say to uh, other developers, it's not restful. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Are you guys using this at Molly? <clears throat> Actually, we apparently we kind of invented it ourselves before there was a name for it. So there there is something related, but it's not as done as smartly as this, I would say. So, um, but it is definitely something that we are looking into for the next iteration and, and for sure the uh, internal APIs that we're using. Because, of course, um, Molly has an API that is years and years old and we are really proud that we have been able to keep it very stable for all these years. Even though with all the, the, the um, developing business processes that we have, uh, it's very diff difficult to not create any breaking changes to your, to your clients. Um, that's often also a very limiting factor, so we're really trying to like find our way there. But internally, we can do what we want, so we can have all the new tricks. Um, according to Sam Newman, the guy I talked before, this is the most important part of, um, of uh, microservices. Actually, my colleague uh, said at the beginning uh, that Sam Newman changed his um, terminology to have this par part of the, the microservice um, uh, wording. So he says uh, it's a microservice is something that can be deployed independently. And um, so, yeah? He said to, you want to change to a more RESTful interface yeah, in upcoming years, I guess. Uh -huh. Did you have, what did you say, about 30,000 customers? Okay. Yeah, you, you can't just ask them to change the interface within, let's say, six months. No, exactly. Well, how, how are you going to plan that? I will talk about it in, in, ah, a, minute, okay. in a minute, actually, so good question. Um, <coughs> I, I told you in the beginning the the um, the two the two pillars I was going to talk about the independent deployable and the hide implementi implementation details sort of were a, a mix in my presentation. I didn't really find a good way to put these in one category. So this is part of the of that of that subject. Um, so it's actually what I what I said to be what I said before. Um, a loosely coupled service knows as little as it needs to about the services. Uh, with which it collaborates. Um, so you have to limit the number of different types of calls from one service to another. The problem if you have, if you split two services that weren't supposed to be split, because they're actually quite, um, um, th there's a lot of cohesion between them, they're kind of the same, then you get a lot of communication between them. They say they become very chatty. And um, that is normally uh, a smell that uh, there's um, tight coupling between them and maybe you, you should merge these two microservices back together because it's using a lot of your systems resources and it might even be a performance problem because you have a lot of communication between these two. Um, so when you, are, when you find yourself in developing a microservice that needs lots of, uh, lots of endpoints to, uh, to communicate with another service, you really have to ask yourself, okay, maybe these two need to be one. <coughs> um, so a system should be cohesive in its capabilities. It should it should work together. It should serve the same goal, um, but it should not be uh, uh, should not attract only new functionality like like the plague, like uh, everything building on on top of. Uh, uh, and this is very very dangerous because often it is very easy when you have a certain system to just put something on it because it kind of works the same way and. You know, it's easy because I already have that object, that consumer object, so why not just put this on it? Like, oh, um, these consumers, I have emails of them here. Okay, so oh, I can build a notification system on top of that because I already have their emails. Nice. But wait, that's, that's kind of not the point. So it's, it goes two ways. Sometimes you want them to be together. Sometimes you need to think twice. And that's often uh, you need to be an advocate in your company to say, like, oh, wait, wait, wait. One step back. Is this the proper place to put this new functionality. And actually one, uh, one of the things I, um, one of the things the, the, the uh, McElroy said in the beginning was you have to be able to write something quickly and throw it out again. So uh, I heard uh, someone say a microservice should not be more than 200 lines of code. <laughs> wow, 200 oh, lines wow. of code, that is really <laughs> tiny. You know? But then uh, you kind of think of the McElroy guy writing uh, 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 
the pipe symbol, but uh, LS, for example, LS, every, every Unix distribution has an own rewritten version of LS, and it does exactly the same thing, and it's like a couple hundred lines of code, so you can pipe it easily into something else. So, maybe, I mean, I'm not saying it should be 200 lines of code, but um, think of that next time you want to make a new feature. Because you don't want your system to look like that, you know, like, oh, you have a building here, and you put that there and there and there, and then it starts to become very brittle, because if you need to change something here, what happens with the house over there, you know? It's kind of uh, dangerous. Okay, so what to do um, when you don't want to <coughs> your, your um, other services or your consumers uh, to force them to upgrade? You don't want to, when you want to deploy separately, you want to not be in a lockstep with other services. You don't say, okay, I'm upgrading this service, so shit, um, this is a dependency, I need to upgrade that as well, because on this one, okay, and if I upgrade this one, you know, because then you lose all the benefits of having a microsystem, a microservice system. Um, the whole thing <coughs> is that your microservices can be deployed independently so that every team can be autonomous. They can just build their stuff, build a new feature, ship it, build a new feature, ship it. And um, what if you introduce a breaking change? Okay, so introduce a new endpoint. Say, okay, uh, we're not forcing you to upgrade, but you know, if you want to get on the new stuff, you have to get on version two. And uh, of course, you cannot introduce stuff like that every couple of months because your consumers, especially your clients, you want they won't, will never be able to co to um, uh, continue with that. But internally when you have microservices, you can tell your colleagues, okay, man, there's some nice new features in this customer service, but you need the new version. And um, you give them time to migrate, because at some point you cannot have a version one, two, three, four, five next to each other, because that will give a lot of overhead in your service, of course. Like ideally, you want to only support one version before the last one, give people some time to upgrade, and then clean up the old code. Um, Another thing I learned, which I thought was really cool, is uh, consumer-driven contracts. And actually, um, they, uh, I read that they sort of set it against end-to-end -end tests. Who's using end-to-end -end tests in the uh, cool? Um, what kind of technology are you using, can I ask? Everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing specific? Selenium. No. Selenium. Okay. Wrappers for Selenium. It's super fast, right? <laughs> it's, not it's, it's, it's better than stuff breaking. It's better than stuff breaking. But you don't want your pipelines to take like hours and hours and, and having it run every time because you want to iterate quickly. You want to line, you want to build a new feature, ship it, and have it live within ideally minutes, let's say, <coughs> not hours. Um, so what is the proposition? Consumer driven contracts um, is creating an expectation of what you expect from the other microservice, making it explicit, and sharing it between the microservices, saying, hey, you know what, customer services, uh, I'm this service, I expect you to give me this response. If you don't give it, I will break. So, uh, PACT is um, something uh, created that facilitates exactly that. And the way it works, is that in your application you um, you, cr you start by defining expectations using pack DSL it's a, a special language and then uh, you launch your mock server to run it and to generate uh, this uh, pack JSON file uh, I mean you can do it yourself but it's it's more work if you do it completely yourself um, then uh, the, this producing side basically gets it um, either from like a central repository or from Backbroker, I will tell something more about that. And, uh, to, and it can verify if the expectations that the, that the consumer uh, service has are being met, and then you can continue to roll out uh, the service. So if this one is trying to upgrade, you can just say, okay, which uh, services are integrating my service? Okay, and what are their expectations? Okay, okay, let's check it. Okay, well, everything seems to still work fine. Okay, I can release, no problem. Um, but they need to access this this thing. So uh, I've seen uh, people committing the one service's uh, expectations directly to the other one. But um, Packbroker is something that another organization made that uh, allows to share these packs between projects. And um, 
it makes it really nice. You don't have to create an end-to-end -end test for every integration you have. You don't have to walk every um, code path or introduce feature in your application, which takes a lot of time. And if you try to do like end-to-end -end, uh, types of end-to-end uh, uh, -end tests, then you will get a lot of tests every time you introduce a new service. Um, Pack Broker also lets you visualize um, the relationships. You don't see it, but there's actually lines between all your services, so you can see exactly which one is depending on which one. And it can generate documentation for you, which is really nice. Is Pack like you have to use a specific language, or is it like no, agnostic? it's agnostic. So there's uh, there's libraries for I don't know Java, JavaScript, uh, a whole bunch of them. You can uh, uh, I will share the slides, and there's. Uh, there's links to the Pack Foundation and Pack Broker and all the things. Where, that where do you manage your dependencies? So I've been thinking about this um, um, because we all we know about semantic versioning. I will talk a bit about that as well. Um, so may, maybe every time you release this kind of uh, thing, um, you should you should let the other services know that. There's new features available, not not breaking uh, not uh, breaking changes because then you will introduce a new endpoint. But um, I, I think it would be smart to have some kind of uh, 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 dependency manager to show where you are, where your microservices, which ones you are using. But I I haven't dived that deep yet. I haven't found one or I haven't really searched for one, but there there must be something. Yeah, you must be in need of some kind of release orchestration. That that sounds like a good plan, exactly. But I, I haven't uh, I haven't read on it yet, so I would be really in it. Someone else knows something for that? <coughs> that we use? No? Okay, I'm, I would be really interested to hear something about that. But doesn't this, the image you're showing here, doesn't that show dependencies? It shows dependencies, but it would be very nice to have in a, in a specific Service to know exactly without having to open this kind of thing to know exactly which things it's it's depending upon, uh, and uh, then you know much easier if you can integrate with a newer version, for example, if it's released of uh, of a microservice that you're depending upon. So uh, yeah. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, culture of automation, and this is actually what I wanted to talk about initially. But uh, well, there was so much more to tell you guys, and there was like the introduction became bigger than the the ending. But uh, the culture of automation is really important with having lots of microservices because the more things you have to deploy, the more things you have to manage. So at some point you can have like a couple of terminals open and be like, okay, this one is running fine, this one is running fine, but uh, after you have your 20th or something microservice, you're gonna lose track. So it's really important to automate <laughs> stuff. Um, because microservices, they, I mean, they add also a lot of complexity. So you have to uh, keep in mind there's lots of moving parts you need to take track of. So uh, there's infrastructure automation, which is important, but I'm not gonna touch a lot about that now. Uh, automated testing, which all of you are doing, of course, uh, and continuous delivery. And um, important in, in the uh, automation is, of course, the, the build pipelines. Um, at Molly, we are <coughs> right now using uh, uh, Bitbucket pipelines to do the continuous integration. And um, struggling, struggling a bit with them, you know, it's... Uh, it's has performance its or performance and uh, wasn't it used to call bamboo? Yeah. No, no, it's yeah. not. It was it's a separate a product. Yeah, um, but they now implement it into Bitbucket uh, the the repos. Okay. So you are building Docker images or what are you building? Yeah, well, it depends on the project. We have yeah. several projects, and um, some of them we are building Docker images. Some of them we are uh, uh, building JavaScript uh, packages yeah. or. Uh, but we're yes. not building any Docker images inside the pipeline. It uh, is okay. possible, but it only became uh, possible after we implemented it in a working situation. Mm -hmm. And we're so just actually doing it in our company. Yeah. This, this kind of pipeline. And stuff. Um, at the moment, we're also uh, looking into several other products to uh, to facilitate our, uh, our continuous integration. 
like uh, Goat Chip, for example, and there's <coughs> several other. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 like Circle CI, Dragon CI, yeah. Jenkins, Goat Chip, whatever. Yeah. Else, there's lots of them. Um, but uh, the thing I learned was that once you have, um, once you build something, create an artifact, that you should use the same artifact when you go through the pipeline. So you should always use the same thing, the same piece of code to test, uh, and not rebuild it every time you go you go into a new phase. And it kind of makes sense because m maybe in a new phase or a new environment you, you introduce uh, a change or a difference between the previous ones, so you cannot be sure. And what are you using as a pipeline orchestrator? Honestly, I, I don't know. Cheered? At the moment it's integrated into Bitbucket. So it's uh, all in one solution, but we're, uh, I mean, uh, all those pipelines can be triggered by uh, push or... Mm, not something like Jenkins or... Uh, no, we don't use Jenkins. Okay. But it's it's sort of the same thing. Right? Yeah, Jenkins is so similar li uh, like uh, pipelines from Bitbucket, only uh, when you use Bitbucket's uh, repo for Git, yeah. you can also uh, use their pipelines and it's already integrated into itself. All right. Okay. So you el eliminate the need for. So is this something to do with bamboo? Or well, <laughs> bamboo is the is the old product, and they recently uh, <laughs> brought it to their cloud Git repos, and it's now Bitbucket pipelines. So it's uh, I think it's still the free uh, trials and stuff, but uh, they're also paid accounts. But you only get it hosted. You only, you only get it in the cloud. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, as far as I know, it is. And if you want to have it uh, on your custom server servers, then you might need Bamboo, but they're phasing it out. Uh, I found out what the thing is that you're all really interested in. Uh, this is the part, the, hmm. the, the pipelines part. In, in the pipeline, you also have the end user acceptance tests. Uh -huh. Are they automated or manual? Um, I think they can be both, right? Yeah, they can, but uh, in, in your case? I mean in our case, it's manual stuff. <coughs> Because uh, I, I personally, I don't really re like to rely on the all the automated um, interaction stuff that that you have to build uh, the end-to-end -end test kind of thing that automated <coughs> the, the, the headless browser clicking through stuff. I'm not a big fan myself. But. Um, Manually introduces. Uh, of course, it should be a slow down in the in the delivery. That, that's why you have packed actually. So of course you have the you have the. Um, uh, Actually, what, what we are introducing right now, or what we are looking into, is to, because the end-to-end -end tests are more of checking if the user interface is still correct and if it's still working, because the end-to-end -end tests make sure that the business layer is functioning correctly, you know? And so the functionality should be there. Then you, ha you can, of course, have an end-to-end -end test to click through your interface to see if every to confirm everything is working, but most of the time when we do that, we figure out it's something, uh, in the u user interface that is off. You know, there's a margin too much there or whatever. And that's kind of st stuff that doesn't have to be found out in, in this end-to-end -end test. You can actually, uh, we are using uh, just uh, snapshots. Uh, so we have a React components and we are using snapshots to see how they are uh, and if they didn't change. Uh, but actually you have the same thing with image snapshots. So you can use just image snapshots to take an image of your interface, it will save it into a PNG file or something in your in your Git repository, and the next time it will just run in the background again and see if your paddings and margins are still the same. And it actually will give you a visual diff of what your how your interface mm -hmm. changed when it changes. That's nice. Didn't put it in my slides, but you should definitely check that out. Uh, just image snapshots. Um, so, um, yeah, I was talking about um, immutability basically in your pipelines, so to make sure that your artifacts are the same once they move through the pipelines. And, and I promised my friend Flo was on the first line that I would talk a little bit about Docker and at least show the logo. <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, yeah. Just to be hip and uh, I don't know. Um, so immutable images and immutable service. Also, the, uh, we are using Kubernetes now uh, for some of our services. And um, it's really nice to have uh, these um, stateless uh, servers uh, running that you can just shoot and then it will just fire up a new one and no problem at all. 
Um, so it's very important oh, wow. that with you, with your deployments you can uh, you can automi uh, automize uh, this stuff so that you just don't have to spend any time on maintaining and looking at that and and, and, and mon of course you should monitor but and which cloud central. provider are you using sorry which cloud google. provider are you using google google, google container engine thing is yes yeah um, so but also actually in the um, also in the regular day to day development and um, I'm, I'm personally I like to do a lot of JavaScript but we're also doing th things in PHP but I, I noticed that we're doing a lot of I don't know repeatable steps here like okay you're developing committing then you push and you publish you have to tag stuff and certainly when you you're using semantic versioning you have to take care that you have the right semantic version you have to think about okay what did I introduce what did I okay I have to have one feature as one there, and I have a fix, so it should be one there. And uh, then you have to tag it, you have to write a bit in a change log so that the other developers, you know, they know what changed. And also, uh, I mean, mostly for our external clients, but also internally, your, your colleagues need to know what changed in the service. And cer certainly when you have all these different microservices and you have this, uh, you have this file that says, okay, I have this version, you want to know, okay, is it worth it to upgrade? So. I would like to automate this too, and um, there's actually a, a package called Semantic Release. Uh, who heard about Semantic Release? Yes. Okay. Not really? Cool. So, so for the JavaScript part, the Semantic Release, um, it basically looks at your commit messages. You have to take a style of commit messages basically, and you can use Commitism, which is a, a command line uh, or, or a CLI tool that um, <coughs> helps you to automate it. You can basically uh, type, for example, make commit, and then you get this uh, uh, interface where you can choose if it was a feature or a fix or uh, or whatever, breaking change. And you can uh, type the scope of your change, and you can type a commit message. And because they are standardized, um, it can actually just at the end, uh, once you release your software, you can just say make release. It will look at these commit messages and say, okay, you introduced so many breaking changes, you introduced so many fixes, so you should be on this version, and uh, you should, I don't know, uh, introduce a new, um, uh, a new, a new uh, version, like major version, because you introduced a breaking change, which is really handy. You don't have to take care of that anymore. Uh, you don't have to worry about that anymore. So check that out. Oh, actually, I have a picture of that interface. So you basically can <coughs> scroll through that saying, okay, uh, it's a refactor, it's a test, it's, it's just a, a chore that I needed to do, it's just a styling issue or whatever. Really easy to also um, uh, group them together, see exactly in your change log, automated change log, what, what changed. So, um, Automating releases with confidence. What can you do? The things I said. Deploy. Oh, just deploy the same way everywhere. Uh, actually, we have, we have like JavaScript and, and and PHP and stuff, and and everyone is using Yarn, and then there's npm and this kind of stuff, and and the composer, and well, we just wanted to standardize it for everyone that opens up a project. You know what you have to do. You can do make deploy or make whatever. It's all the same. That's really nice. Um, <coughs> use your build pipelines. Uh, use the contract driven test with, for example, Pact. Uh, coexist multiple endpoints to be able to iterate fast and to just continue developing, giving your teams the uh, ownership of their products and use a uh, semantic versioning. So these were the, the, the topics I talked about and uh, I would say try to automize everything and uh, kill all humans. <laughs> Can you can you detail more about the semantic version of uh, microservices? Uh, exactly what uh, what you mean? So semantic versioning is is uh, um, I'm not sure how um, what you know about semantic versioning. Well, it, the term itself uh, I don't know exactly what it means, but uh, okay, so I probably <coughs> can deduce uh, an idea. Yeah, so there's there's. Uh, there's this number with uh, um, a, fir a first number, dot, second number, third number, 
the, the third number indicates when there has been uh, a fix, some minor thing changed to fix an, a problem like a bug or something, um, but did not break in any way the code. The second uh, number um, explains that there has been an, an, a feature introduced, a new feature that could be interesting for you. Uh, and the first number is the, the, the major or the breaking change. If that updates, you know for sure that uh, a breaking change was introduced. So your software might not uh, work anymore once you upgrade. So basically this, this number, this version that you're on, uh, signifies exactly which features you have and uh, how big of a trouble an upgrade might be. Okay, but in, how then you relate that with um, what uh, you mentioned about the endpoints of uh, several versions of right. uh, the microservices? Right. Because then, um, well, I don't know if you tagged it on the on the development. Then you know uh, that a major version was introduced and some breaky changes uh, were also introduced. Right. But. Um, how do you relate that with the versioning of uh, endpoints to, to, of the microservices for your clients? So there's are they directly related, or I, I think that would be a good idea. I think you can play with that yourself, and uh, depends on how you want to do that. For us, uh, for us, it's, it doesn't matter. We have like one for like externally, we have one version. We make sure it works for everyone. We don't introduce breaking changes. But you can go as granular as you want yourself. <coughs> for me, I would say the endpoint is uh, the only thing that's really important to know is if does it break or not. So uh, for me, the major version is the most important. Uh, so um, you have a version one and version two, like I said, the, the two ones next to each other. Uh, once it really breaks, you introduce a second version <coughs> and you tell everyone to upgrade. But of course, if you want to go more granular and say, okay, I, I created another feature, this is a, another endpoint, or give me a header with the right ver the version that you want, I don't know, it's, it's up to you, I guess. Uh, you said you won't change the interface to your customers? Is that what you said to us, or did I miss I, it? Uh, of course, there are changes in our API. Uh, our customer facing API, <laughs> but uh, they're not breaking changes. So we keep support for what we had before. We're, we, of course, we introduce new features, uh, but we do it without breaking. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool, more questions? Cool. Then let's yeah, okay.